Yeah, so I'm uh, Zachary Schneider, and I'm going to be talking about uh, basically a console love story, uh, our, our path to uh, better living through, through console. I started my journey uh, in SaaS at uh, Rackspace, where I was part of the team that re-engineered uh, cloud sites, Rackspace Cloud DNS, and uh, Cloud Databases, which is their version of RDS. Uh, at Boundary, I was operations architect, and I worked on the Boundary Flow product uh, and the Boundary Premium, which was a server monitoring product. Uh, about a year and a half ago, Boundary was acquired by BMC, uh, specifically to utilize our uh, ingress technologies uh, on which to build their next generation SaaS products and platform. Um, I'd like to give a special, special thanks to one of the devs I work very closely with, uh, Jesse Hodges. Um, so, you know, all this is a team effort, and without him, we wouldn't have achieved uh, the integration that, that we've done. Okay, thanks. Um, so, I'm going to do this a little bit differently. So, what I'll go over first is what I consider to be an ideal state uh, in regards to uh, a user or operator experience uh, with, a, with, with, with a platform. Um, then I'll talk about the path that we used to get there, uh, the benefits, and then I'll go more in depth into the code that, that drives the, the solution that we created. Um, then what, what we're going to do next, and uh, I've included resources uh, in the talk. So uh, an ideal state. Um, hopefully everyone remembers their first time with Linux. I mean, I do. I remember going out of the library and uh, grabbing a giant Linux Unleashed book. And in the back was a Red Hat CD. And I just remember how amazed I was that I could install any piece of software in this distribution with essentially one command, uh, if it didn't have any dependencies. Um, so, so that was great. So uh, what I'll demo now is you know, what it looks like from the operator's perspective. Um, and what you're going to see is I'll install a service, it'll start up, it'll register with console. Uh, when it's uninstalled, it deregisters from console. Uh, the discovery process uh, for other apps that, that intercommunicate is via a uh, load balanced HTTP client in the process itself. Um, and each service also exposes a health endpoint which console uh, checks. So. So this is the console UI. You've probably seen it a couple of times, hopefully already. Um, we already have the bar service up and running um, on port 9999. So we have this, this little example page. And, and what this is showing is um, our service is registered directly in Nginx with no config management. So this is what the bar service is serving currently. Uh, the foo service isn't started up, so I get a 500 error. Um, and we got another. We have another service, uh, which is only a backend service, which we're going to go ahead and install. So we installed Snarf. Snarf is awesome. And we will also start up uh, the foo service. So go back to console, and we see that you know I app get installed. Uh, Snarf, he's up and registered. Just an HTTP request, and he's on 988. And now we should also have foo. And I've done nothing, and foo is registered and terminated in nginx. Um, so in my mind, that's you know kind of the the ideal uh, operator. Uh, experience. You just install software and it works. Uh, so things weren't always that great at, at Boundary. It took a while to uh, get to this point. Um, this is kind of uh, where we started out. And so there's a lot of HA proxy. Uh, all of this is driven by massive amounts of config management. Uh, we had three different monitoring systems and Graphite. 
So you know, I'm not really sure. I wasn't there, so I'm not sure how we got to this state. I kind of feel like this might be some sort of ops PTSD kind of going on, or maybe, um, you know, maybe these different monitoring systems had functionality that the others didn't. I'm not sure. But we were running three. And uh, the little uh, keyboard type patterns, those represent all the different agents we were running. Um, they kind of match up with the, the letters on the side. Um, so yeah, with this, we were kind of using 20 to 30% of our system resources just monitoring um, the service that we were trying to provide our customers. And um, the HA proxy fan out, this is, I guess this is a, a, a well-known pattern. I'd never seen it before. But there's a HA proxy service stub that runs on every single node that so you don't have to configure each service. It talks to localhost and the port, and it will fan out to all your other services. So this is just an example. We had a service called Shepard, which interacted with auth. Um, and this might not seem too bad, and it avoids a single point of failure. But you multiply. We had 32 microservices. Oops, I said micro. Uh, we had 32 services. <laughs> and this gets pretty ugly uh, the more services you add, especially at the network level. Um, our config management code base, uh, we did a line count when we decided to take a step back and look at this, and it was 75% the size of our product code base. <laughs> uh, that's not so great, <laughs> really. So some of that code was used because we were on uh, real hardware, so we, you know, we, there's more to deal with with real hardware. But uh, that's still not that, that great, right? So we had four ops working on config management. That config management was dealing with the product. Uh, and then we had our devs uh, solely focusing on uh, product. So uh, why would I say this? Um, configuration management is a delivery vehicle for unfinished work. When I, when I look at that, when I see us just kind of cobbling together various pieces of infrastructure and connecting the dots, I just feel like, well, we're all writing software, right? We're writing software that manages software. How about we just direct that focus to the actual product and, and finish our work? Um, the previous model, you know, it's not great, but it's sustainable if you have four operators. But life isn't static. Uh, things change, and adversity strikes usually at the worst point in time. So we had a bit of, of a pivot. We had to merge two, uh, two different sets of technical debt, I mean uh, tech stacks. Um, and we, we changed focus with the company. Uh, so when that happens, you know, inevitably some people aren't that happy. And they decide maybe to do something else. Uh, so we were down to one operator. I wonder who that was. Uh, and we also had a, a new requirement come up. Uh, because the big boogeyman of SaaS is that eventually someone's going to show, show up and they're going to cut you a check big enough that you will have to go and deploy your SaaS product on-prem. Um, so that happened a couple of times. Um, so we really couldn't deploy that on-prem and expect uh, another team that isn't familiar with our stack, that's, you know, we, couldn't, we couldn't expect them to run our config management. So we really needed to start thinking differently about how we developed our systems. Um, so, and I'd done this a couple of times, and it, it was the same pattern at Rackspace and, and beyond. Um, we would set up these huge monitoring stacks, and we would set up all this config management. And uh, the product never really got any better in regards to operability. Uh, all our focus was directed on just managing this stuff and not on making, you know, whether it was OpenStack or um, Boundary, uh, more operable by normal people. Uh, so what we decided to do this time is focus our effort on the product itself um, and uh, try to achieve a better result. So the first thing we needed to do we basically we had this uh, custom deployment system, and it was kind of two phases. So we had Chef that would do some things, and I really don't know why it did what it did, but it would sometimes install software and sometimes not, and we would configure the sidecar HA proxy. Uh, but we also had a Ruby tool called Small Wonder 
and we would use that to deploy our services. And that was okay, but if you've ever worked with a bunch of Java devs, uh, and then it comes to deploy time and crunch time, and uh, you get to play hunt for the working uh, Ruby install, uh, which is kind of funny, is I think one or two people out of 14 would have a working Ruby install at any given time. So that wasn't so great. So we kind of wanted to get that off the client. Uh, so what we did is uh, we decided to adopt Surf. Surf was pretty cool. Uh, you didn't have to run any servers. It was an agent. You installed the agent. I know we have a lot of agents, but I figured, you know, maybe we can remove Chef and, and add this agent and go to a solo pattern, and that would be better. So that's kind of what we did. We did a bit of refactoring. We moved to a Chef solo pattern. And we utilized uh, a small orchestration tool that basically did ordered Chef runs uh, that sat on top of Surf. And you know, at least then, if we had to go on-prem with this product, our customers would not have to run Chef servers. Uh, we could extend Cascade to suit their needs and, and what their update schedule was. Uh, and we started delivering the Chef solo code with packages. So now. Uh, all of our uh, configure management and deployment was in one chef run. Um, system updates uh, deployed at the same time, and we could test those releases. And this is better, but we still have our three monitoring systems. Uh, there's no single authority for systems and application health. Uh, there's still a lot of load balancer stubs. There wasn't just one of these. Um, on each node for every service, there was multiple ones. So there's all the config management driving that. And um, Surf doesn't really provide abil uh, the ability to do any locking. So when you have 12 people and they're distributed, and you have everyone trying to get their updates in, you kind of want to make sure when you're rolling software out across your various tiers that only one person is doing this at a time. So we needed to solve for that. But you know, the big deal was let's get rid of some of these agents. Uh, let's recoup some of our compute and memory. So we took a shortcut, um, and we did some work in our services and made them more responsible for their own health. So uh, how many people, so Java shops, raise your hand if you're a Java shop. Dot, uh, .NET, Node, OK. So everybody's here. Um, so we're a Java shop, and we utilize uh, Drop Wizard, and it's fully integrated with the Code of Hale metrics library. And for everything that is critical, uh, we have counters in our services, and they expose an HTTP health uh, endpoint. And when something is wrong, they return 500 with a descriptive error message of exactly what's wrong. So if it's an ingress service, it complains about Kafka. If it's you know. HTTP, it'll complain about network connectivity or you know, whatever else it's connecting to. Um, and so Sensu was pulling that. Um, we didn't have anything with SERP. So that was this intermediate step. So we still needed to get rid of all the HA proxy stuff, and we started looking at console. Uh, at first, we had some reservations. We were already hev heavily invested in Zookeeper. We could have done all this stuff with Zookeeper, but it wasn't going to be easy. Uh, the, the surf event query API I thought was a little bit better, and there were no node system tags uh, in surf or in um, in console. However, you know we're kind of tied to Kafka. Uh, we're not going to get off zk. Um, I found out I could work with the watch API. It had batteries included for service discovery. Uh, the HTTP API is, is huge for accessibility. We could use a curl command to do just about anything. Uh, so debugging-wise, it was great. And every programming language out there has an HTTP client. So the console API is amazing, and it's well-structured and well-formed. And you can do a lot just with an HTTP client. You don't need to go get a console client. However, if you're doing Go services, uh, the, the Go API client is top-notch. So, so after console, we basically just uh, replaced Surf. And we rewrote Cascade to sit on top of uh, console. Um, and we just swapped in the, the console agent. So 
this was basically prep work, and we were able to prototype all the things that we were going to do with our service integration in config management, so there's no risk. So we had that all ready to go and ensure that it worked, and uh, it was all online, so there's no big rollouts or anything. Um, so then we made some rules, and we talked to our devs, and these are the rules. Essentially, all services must register their information. They must register their health checks. Um, and services that communicate with each other via HTTP must use an in-process load balancing HTTP client seated uh, with console. And I think we chose to write our own there. Um, but So Netflix has ribbon. There's some other options, um, especially for .NET. So after service discovery, we're looking a little bit better. Uh, we're down to the Sensu agent and the console agent. So that's good. Uh, system resources plus plus. And oh, yeah, the other thing we went and did along the way was we started self-consuming our own metrics to monitor our own platform with itself. Because if you're a monitoring company, it's probably a good thing to dog food your own work. And if your monitoring system can't monitor itself, you probably should just go home. Seriously. So we did that. Uh, moving on to the, the next portion, like finishing up the monitoring story, um, we already had the health checks in console. Uh, we hadn't really investigated what to do there, but it turned out all we really needed to do was shuttle the, the console faults to our favorite pager service. Uh, so we found this open source uh, uh, daemon called console alerts, and we made a few changes. It runs on multiple nodes, so it's fault tolerant. And then we ended up with this. And so now our services, they report their health. If there's a fault, console alerts, uh, pushes it to Ops Genie. We chose to move from PagerDuty to Ops Genie because we could do complex routing to various teams depending on who wrote what. Because it doesn't really make sense to wake up devs for infrastructure, uh, and it doesn't make sense to to wake up ops if someone pushed some bad code and uh, their service is failing in prod. So now everybody's happy. Everybody's getting the right alerts. Well, I think everyone's happy. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, there's, there's a number of benefits here. Um, resource usage uh, with, with service supervision, the architecture is, is fault tolerant. Um, uh, adding capacity now, all we do is bootstrap a node with Terraform. That's it. Comes online. Uh, basically, the software install process, you just install packages, and they come online, they register, everything talks to each other, and it's nice. Uh, console now serves as their infrastructure API, so when we go to on-prem, we have the unified interface to interact with, and our customers can interact with it as well. Um, the architecture development is sustainable because we have these rules. Every new service must do these certain things, or it does not go to production. So that's great. And our config management is next to nil now. We're not down to zero yet, but we're, we're a lot closer. Uh, so this is the service DSL that our devs use to deploy new services. Uh, so they just add a template and define the ports. And uh, we use um, JWT tokens, so some of them will have keys. And uh, SV weight is a little bit of technical debt because we're on run it and there's no dependencies there, so we have to define that. Um, but that'll be gone soon too, so they don't have to do that much. Um, so now I can, I'll just go through a little bit of the code. We drove some of these small examples. So I'm not sure how many people are familiar with Vertex, but um, it's a polyglot, I would say, service framework uh, that you can use multiple JVM languages. You use Ruby because it's, it's fairly easy to read. But there's a start hook. And this is basically what we do with our Java services. But we just you know, define a JSON blob. And on startup, we register. Uh, if you're registering a health check, that would be in here too. It's just basically more JSON. Uh, and then on stop, we deregister. 
So this is just a plain HTTP client. There's not that much. Um, oh, again, all this is in GitHub. The resources uh, slide has all this in it, and it also has the, uh, the Nginx uh, console lab that will teach you how to do dynamic uh, upstream console lookups directly from Nginx uh, via Lua. Uh, so what you're looking at now, this is, well, actually, let me show you this first. So basically what we do in our Nginx config, this is pretty minimal, but we define our URI fragments. Um, we instantiate our console load balancer uh, in the init worker by Lua block. And this allows us to save state per worker thread in the module. So we can implement round robin. We define our endpoints and what service they need to go to. This goes to foo, that goes to bar. Uh, and then this doesn't have to be here, but it's, it's great for the example. It just kind of shows you how to reinstantiate your already loaded module. Um, we pass in what service uh, it wants to get next, and that returns the node IP pair uh, to the load balancer, uh, to the upstream load balancer. And the actual code that drives that is, let's see, yeah, 105 lines of Lua. Um, if you look at the Nginx API that surfaced by Lua, you'll see that it's, it's a lot like Node.js. And so we have a timer. And the timer basically, this is a rudimentary. We're not doing any watches or anything. We're just refreshing the catalog every 15 seconds. Um, so that's what this function here does. And if there's a fault, it handles it. Um, this starts the timer, and it's just a recursive function. It starts at zero, so it gets an immediate refresh, and then ever after, it's at whatever you pass in. Um, and this is the next function that saves state and returns the next uh, IP in the list for the round robin load balancing. Um, so yeah. So so next, um, you know we're not done. We still have, um, we're still distributing secrets and some variable data per environment in. Uh, encrypted packages, we want to get away from that. Uh, we'd like to store just small snippets of environment configs in console, because the idea really isn't just to take all your config and move it into console. Uh, what you want to try to do is deliver, because config really doesn't change over time. You'll dial it in, and there'll be small bits that change per environment, and you can just go ahead and, and deal the uh, uh, d deploy the static bits right with your um, application. Uh, but there are dynamic values. We want to be able to store those in console and toggle them. So we, we want to start doing that. We used to have a great thing in Boundary Enterprise called Feature Flipper, and we could turn on various features for various sets of users. So we want to do that again, and instead of using Zookeeper, use console. Um, we want our secrets out of encrypted packages in, in the vault, and we want that integrated at the application level. Uh, but the great thing, since now we can just install our software and it registers itself, uh, we're ready for scheduler. So we've done all the pre-work, and for our compute and memory services, we can now look at Nomad for scheduling. And uh, here's the resources. Uh, I'm assuming we'll have these posted somewhere. If not, I'll post them. Um, but there's just a couple for the, the tools that we use. Some of these we wrote. Uh, they're up in GitHub for the service integration. Um, I wrote a blog post that fully describes how to get set up and built packages for um, Ubuntu if you want to try out the uh, console load balancer integration. Uh, our deployment orchestration tool, Cascade, is open source. Uh, I don't re recommend that you use it. You can if you want. Uh, but it's a great way to learn. Um, if you want to build your own orchestration, how to use the events in the watch API, et cetera. Uh, and for health, uh, there's a small presentation where we're going with health. Oh, I forgot about that. Um, our health checks actually also detect and report on the health of their dependencies. So what that means is if we do a walk of our faulted health checks, 
we can actually map a failure. We can build a graph of a failure and only show the user uh, what's failing. Oh, and one last thing, probably the coolest thing, is now our devs uh, with our full stack, you know, Vagrant setup, uh, they now have a single pane of glass when their, you know, distributed systems are hard. We have 18 services on our new setup, and now uh, when they boot up their Vagrant VMs, and if something doesn't quite grow, go right, or if they've deployed master and something's broken, console tells them exactly what's wrong. So it's really kind of changed our entire dev workflow. Uh, our devs love it, and I love it, and it's great. So thank you.